I was told when I was diagnosed with IIH that it was linked to my weight. Now I found it quite upsetting, so can you tell me more about why there's this association between IIH and being overweight? Yeah, it's a difficult and very emotive area, but we certainly know from the studies that have been done um, that there does tend to be an uh, increased weight in patients that have IIH. And in fact, we tend to talk about weight in medical terms um, through terminology such as the body mass index. And the body mass index is a defined term which says that people with a body mass index over 30 are obese. Now we know that that word obesity isn't very nice for anybody to hear, but sometimes we do need to talk about the fact that the IH is related to weight and that by helping to reduce the weight can improve the condition. But then I think a lot of my patients, they say to me, well, what is it to do with the weight? Because lots of, lots of patients or lots of people become overweight, yet they don't get IIH, and lots of men can get overweight, yet they don't get IIH. So it is, it is very interesting and it doesn't really seem fair to the individual patient, but we certainly see the increased weight and we are now doing a lot more research to understand why weight is increasing brain pressure. So you're beginning to understand why the weight does... It's the difficult, I think it's, early, early, stages. it's <laughs> early days and we're looking at things that the actual fat cells can secrete. So weight is composed of fat cells and these fat cells themselves, they do more than just increase how big you are, they actually secrete chemicals. And these chemicals can cause inflammation, they can secrete actually uh, hormone chemicals. And so we're starting to look out in the laboratory how these different chemicals coming from the fat actually alter the brain pressure. And I think we've got a lot more to learn there. But actually by understanding that, we may be able to start to make drugs that will directly target the weight, help people to lose weight potentially, and help people to reduce their brain pressure. So that's what we're trying to do in, in the, on the science side. In terms of, for, for you, I'm sorry it was difficult when they talk to you about weight. It's often one of the first things that um, people hear about when they're diagnosed, and I've heard from many of my patients that that can be quite upsetting, and I think we are trying to learn to say Do it you know delicately. the percentage um, of how many people, like in larger ladies, what percentage are more likely to get IIH than those that aren't on the large side? We don't really know the cutoff weight um, for IIH, but it tends to be people that are obese, which means this body mass index greater than 30. But we do sometimes see IIH diagnosed with people below a uh, body mass index of 30, and it, it may well be related to weight in those patients too. And what we tend to then do is be a bit more careful to investigate and look for any other of those secondary causes of IIH. We might want to exclude things like anemia, other drug causes, other hormone causes. So we look at it perhaps a little bit more carefully. And in the patients that have got obesity relating to their IIH, we often talk about how much weight has changed over the last six to 12 months when their symptoms have been getting worse? Have their weight been going up, been going down? And if weight was going up, was there anything that triggered that? So sometimes we talk about some drugs that patients go on that actually could trigger off a weight gain. Sometimes people tell us that they've been diagnosed with other conditions such as thyroid, hypothyroidism, thyroid disease, which can trigger weight gain. So we often try and go into a bit more detail and see, well, why has weight changed? Because it's often that change that actually can set the IIH off. And similarly, down the line, once we've once we've diagnosed you and things are stable and we're helping you to lose weight, we've seen from the studies that if weight comes back up again, it, it can re-trigger a relapse of the IIH. So it is a difficult thing. How much weight would I have to lose? That's a really good question and it's actually probably not the easiest one to answer. So I think it's probably very patient specific. We've seen some patients lose in the region of a couple of stone and do very well. Some people have lost three stone and have completely reversed their IIH, whereas other patients need to lose a lot more. So it's quite difficult to know. So from the research side, we've seen people having improvements with around 6 to 15 kilograms of weight loss. That's so quite, uh, quite a wide interval. Um, and there haven't really been big enough or conclusive enough studies to say exactly how much weight a patient needs to lose. So there's more research needs doing in that. Yeah, and I can't give you a magic number, which I know is frustrating. But we do see that it's quite individual to some patients. So the, the advice would be to try and lose weight. Um, because and, you know that helps. Yeah. And it may be, what, what I saw when we ran a previous trial using weight loss to treat IIH was that people that lost weight each week, eventually we'd see them one week and the ringing in the ears, the tinnitus would go, the headaches would start to improve and the eyes would start to improve at a very specific cutoff. So there is that research proof that losing yeah. weight will help me. Yeah, so we ran a study that was published in 2010 um, in the British Medical Journal and that study was really a proof of concept to say, well, we know that there is increased weight in IIH, but how do we know that losing weight gets you better. 
So what we did was we did a crossover style trial, which meant that in the beginning, for three months, patients did nothing different to what they would normally do, and we measured their vision and their brain pressure at the beginning and after doing nothing for three months. And then we put them onto a study where we helped them to lose significant weight with a milkshake diet for three months. Now we knew that it wasn't going to be a long-term option, but we just wanted to prove if you shifted weight, could you bring the brain pressure down? And sure enough, at the end of the milkshake diet, they'd lost around 15% of their body weight with significant improvements in their eyes, their brain pressure, their papilledema. So it was a really nice study to say, yes, if you lose weight, it definitely, in every single patient in the study, it they every, all, every single one. Every single patient brought their brain pressure down. So it was a really conclusive study. But then I guess what I saw as a clinician after that study was that some of the patients, of course, regained weight. We know how hard it is when you diet to then keep the weight off. That's even harder sometimes. But as you regain the weight, the IH then symptoms. symptoms return. Yeah, they came back and the papilledema came back. So there, there is a, a very direct relationship, um, but we also appreciate it. It's a hard thing to address. And I guess mm. that direct relationship, you still not sure what that is. Yes, exactly. You know the relationship's there, but... Yeah, but we don't, we don't know how much weight needs to be lost, and we don't know why the weight is doing it. But these are interesting and important questions for the future. Yeah.